thank you, thank you for this insightful and, and thought-provoking panel. Um, when I was growing up in the military government of uh, Argentina, uh, the government launched a very effective propaganda campaign. It was called El Silencio es Salud, Silence is Health. Now the city appeared plastered with banners like the one you see on the screens, and for good measure, the obelisk, which is the center uh, monument in the city that is seen by millions of people every day, sport a huge rotating sign that said, El Silencio es Salud, the same message. Now, ostensibly, the campaign was against uh, too much uh, uh, car honking, you know, the, the, their, their horns in traffic, but the real goal of the message wasn't lost to anybody. It said that speaking your mind is dangerous and you better stay silent. Now, the, the slogan of El Silencio es Salud came to my mind uh, while I was preparing for my remarks today. And I found myself thinking, well, if I stand here and I speak about politics, half of the room is going to be offended. And if I stand here and don't talk about politics and talk about uh, trends in philanthropy without you know, ignoring the elephant in the room, uh, the other half is going to be offended. So uh, the message that the generals are seared in my young brain so effectively um, kept coming to me. Better if at this time I just don't open my mouth at all. And then I realize that I'm not alone in this, in this predicament. Uh, most of my colleagues in the Jewish philanthropic world perceive more and more that speaking your mind is dangerous. The saddest piece of data that I've seen lately was from a survey of rabbis that said that 32% of them, a full third of rabbis in North America, are afraid to talk about Israel from the pulpit. They fear, and with good reason, that the thought police of both sides of the spectrum will come after them if they say something that they disagree with. And at the end of the day, they have families to feed, mortgages to pay, and colleges to save for. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I saw a surreal spectacle of Jewish leaders agonizing of whether to sign or not a statement in solidarity with the victims of anti-Semitism. Now, let me repeat that. We were afraid of signing a statement against anti-Semitism. People fear it, would, it can be interpreted as political. Federation's leaders go to work every day, and their goal in the day is to make sure that no donor gets offended. And, um, you know, if they take this position is wrong, if they don't take that position is wrong, the less they say altogether, the better. El silencio es salud. But silence is actually not healthy. It's the opposite of healthy. Silence is what cemeteries are known for. Silence is what the general wanted. Silence is what the Soviet Union wanted. A silent community is not a vibrant one. The Jews, we are the most talkative people on earth. We're not a silent people. You know, the Jewish communities that we remember today as models of vibrancy and life are the communities in which everybody spoke their minds and fought over stuff. The Jewish community that we see today as vibrant are the one in which listening and speaking is seen as healthy. Listening more than speaking. You know, and especially in this time in which we live, this message is very important. When, when thinking about the times in which we're living, um, an Irish joke comes to mind, and I'm going to spare you the Irish accent. I think we have enough with one accent. Um, you know, two guys are sitting in a bar, and um, one goes to the next and said, oh, I can't uh, help by noticing that uh, you're from Ireland. Yes, indeed, I'm from Ireland. I'm from Ireland, too. What a nice coincidence. And where in Ireland are you? I'm from Dublin. Oh, I'm from Dublin, too. That's an amazing coincidence. And what street? Oh, it's old McClary Street in the, in the old town. Wow, I can't believe it. I'm from McClary Street, too. And what school did you go to? Uh, St. Mary's, of course. Everybody went to St. Mary's. Get out. I've been to St. Mary's, too. And what year did you graduate? 1964. Me, too. That's crazy. So the bartender is shaking his head. I say, it's going to be a very long night. The Murphy twins are drunk again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, when looking... When looking at the world today, we can't help but have the feeling that we are 
somehow in the midst of a long night. God forbid I'm not referring to a night like Elie Wiesel described in his book. I'm not, I'm not being political. I'm not referring to a night that started on, on, uh, in, the, in the recent elections. We have this feeling that we're living in times that are darkening for a long time already. For years, we have lived through times of polarization, intolerance, and fear. The paroxysm of anti-Semitism that we see today has been foreshadowed by an ugly reality of BDS and campus anti-Semitism. The viciousness in our communal debates today is not different to what we've been seeing in the last couple of years. Uh, we seem to live in an age of high anxiety. It's what Rabbi Sachs called a low serotonin society. Now, for a while already, we think that we're like swimmer, swimmers uh, doing the backstroke towards a waterfall. Uh, we live in times of upheaval and change, and the darkness comes not necessarily from what's happening, but from the feeling of lack of control of what's happening. And we may be all different in our political and ideological beliefs, but something that we can deny is that we live in, shift, in, in big shifts, in big transformation that force us to reassess the realities on the ground. All around us, there is unpredictability. All around us, there is massive change. And there is a feeling, as we heard before, that the old models do not respond to the challenges we're facing. So the question for us as funders, as communal leaders, and as individual Jews is how do we move through this night? Um, of, you know, how do we navigate this uncertainty and change? How do we emerge from the other side, not only unscathed, but stronger and better? From our place of relative power and privilege, how do we shepherd the community towards a better future? What are the strategies that we need to uh, deploy? What of our basic assumptions need to be changed? So I want to offer five tips that may help us. The first way in which we can get through the night is to remember this. When it's too dark to see, stop and listen. In times of change, learning is critical. Listening is critical. All of us agree that there has to be more listening in communal discourse, but what we really mean by that is that other people should listen more to us. We, and, and that's not going to work because as a community, we need to give people the space and the time to wrestle freely with what bothers them, with what scares them, with their hopes, their dreams, their frustration. And in times of change, silence is unhealthy. Speaking up, saying what's in your heart is what's healthy. But developing a culture of listening is also important because what gets us through uncertainty is cognitive diversity. The fact that many of us were surprised by the latest election results shows us to what extent we live in echo chambers. We're not exposed to different viewpoints. And that happens in so many aspects of our philanthropic work. As funders, we set the tone. If we welcome cognitive diversity in our foundation, in our grantees, the community will follow. Like an ecosystem, the philanthropic community needs diversity. The lack of diversity creates entropy, and in nature, entropy is the harbinger of death. My friends, in these times of divisiveness and polarization, we will disagree. That's not a question. Moreover, because everything is treated as an existential threat, minor arguments are going to be seen as life and death uh, struggles. So in this context of polarization and fear, the question is not whether we will disagree, but whether those disagreements are going to destroy the very fabric of the Jewish community. And the answer to that lies to a great degree in our hands. We can surrender to the, to the heckler's veto, or we can learn and push the community to learn with us, to listen with love, tolerance, and compassion. We can understand that those that don't think like us are just wrestling with the same issues that we are wrestling, and in many cases, they are hurting and they are afraid as we are. We can use the power of the purse in a positive way to generate spaces of dialogue 
and tolerance. We can have communities that are havens of respect or we can surrender to the ugliness that surrounds us. A lot of that is being done by many in this room, but more needs to be done. Second, to find your way through the darkness, you need a beacon. And the lights that help you navigate uncertainty and change are nothing other than your values. In times of upheaval, when everything seems unhinged, you need the moral clarity that only your values can give you. And Jewish values aren't liberal or conservative. No party, no ideology can claim ownership of something that is millennia old. Nothing that is defined by the political struggles of the moment can claim ownership of the Jewish value. Precisely the opposite. Focusing on values takes us away from the day-to-day -day political struggles. So precisely now, when everybody is obsessed with technology, with management buzzwords, I encourage all of us to, in, to devote time, effort, and yes, funding to clarifying and strengthen our bedrock values in our families, in our families, and in our communities. And if we find that this situation with, brings values into conflict, so be it. Let's not pretend it's easy. Let's wrestle with that tension. Let's have real conversation with our colleagues, our children, our grantees about values, about the things that matter. And then let's live by the beautiful phrase of the physicist Neil Bohr, who said that while the opposite of a trivial truth is a falsehood, the opposite of a profound truth is another profound truth. Third, to get through the night, it helps you if you don't convince yourself that it's high noon. We must recognize how hard it is to see clearly in times of change. We need to remember the Danish proverb, usually misattributed to Yogi Berra, one of my favorite philosophers. Um, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So in, in our era, the only thing we can say about predictions is that they have been consistently wrong. But our philanthropic strategies are built on the fallacy that the world is stable and largely predictable. They assume that the future is going to be an extrapolation of the past. And it's not. It's going to be a radical new reality. We lack the strategic flexibility. And most important, we, not, we lack the cultural comfort with ambivalence and ambiguity. Imagine yourself how different your strategy would look if you ask yourself not what is probable, but what range of outcomes are plausible in a very unstable world. Imagine how resilient our community would be if we helped our grantees to be prepared for different alternative scenarios. Now, in these times, having built-in flexibility is critical. Learning to fail is critical because we need a lot of trial and error. Nobody has ever yet lived in these uncharted waters of the early 21st century. Nobody can tell you for sure what will work and, we will, and what will not work. We are all together in the same darkness. As Samuel Beckett said, we need to ever try, ever fail, try again, fail again, and fail better. We need the courage to dare and the humility to learn. Fourth, in times of crisis and changes, we need to look at the fringes of society. If you had lived in the 15th century and you ask somebody, what is the most important thing that happened recently? People will tell you is the end of the 100 days war between England and France, or is the fall of Constantinople, or um, is the, 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 the last um, uh, episode of the Black Death, and yet, the most consequential thing that happened in the mid-15th century was taking place far from the headlines in a dingy, dark uh, workshop in Mainz, Germany, where Johannes Gutenberg was, was inventing the printing press. Nobody at the time foresaw the consequences of that. That thing that what happened in that little workshop gave us literacy, gave us a scientific revolution, and the iPhone. <laughs> so. But if you were looking at the 15th century with an horizon of five or four years, you would have never realized that. Now, all around us, 
there are little dark workshops where the future is being created. And if we only think in an immediate horizon of days and weeks, we're going to be missing the phenomena that are going to change the next centuries, not the next years. Five, in this time of uncertainty, it's important to have the right type of leadership. The temptation is always in times of change to go back to the paradigm of the old strong leader, to command and control. But in these troubled and certain times, we don't need more command and control. We need better means to engage everybody's intelligence in solving challenges and crises as they arise. I think that a major act of leadership right now, a radical act of leadership, is somebody who can create processes so people can actually learn together using our diverse experiences. Somebody that can guide us through face the hard questions instead of providing us with easy answers. My friends, what is happening today around us in America, in Israel, in JCCs, in campuses, everywhere will determine the future of our communities for decades to come. The future will not just happen to us, it will be the consequence of our choices. Chesterton said it beautifully, I do not believe in a fate that falls on men however they act, but I do believe in a fate that falls on men unless they act. Our sages go further. The Midrash notes that every time that a verse starts with the words, and it came to happen, tragedy follows. When we just let things happen, calamity follows. Inaction breeds disaster. Now you've indulged me in a metaphor about a long dark night, and the best biblical example of somebody who had to undergo a long night was Jacob. And what did he do? Two things. He dreamt and he fought. Dreams are the basic building blocks of life. Without dreams, we don't live, we just exist. And dreams have the capacity to heal and offer us new beginning. In Hebrew, the word for dream, halom, has the same root of the word for healing, leachlim. Our dream heals us. And philanthropy is all about dreaming and is about helping others realize their dreams. But Jacob's story teaches us that dreaming is not enough. You have to act, you have to make the personal commitments and difficult personal choices, and sometimes you have to fight. Jacob fights with an angel, and the rabbis wonder, what does that angel represent? And the interpretation that I like the most is that the angel represents himself. He's not fighting an external force. He's fighting against his own insecurities, his own breaks his own barriers in transforming his dreams into action. And yet, we are named after him. We're named after the one that dreamt and fought. We are Israel, the one that fights with God, the one that confronts unsurmountable odds and prevails even when everything seems lost. That is why stubborn optimism for Jews is hardwired in our character as Yehuda just said, is not a bug, is a feature of who we are. You know, at the Golden Calf episode, uh, Moses, you know, God wants to destroy the Jews, and Moses advocates for them and said, don't do it because they are stubborn and stiff-necked people. And it's kind of weird because you're defending them, but you're telling something bad about them. So it doesn't, unless it's not something bad. Unless what he really means is that that stubbornness, that willingness to remain optimist, is what will help us survive. He seemed to be saying others will try to convert them, but they are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. Others will tell them they can't survive, but they are a stubborn and stiff-necked people, and they will survive. Others will tell them that they can't have a state of their own, but they are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. Others will try to threaten them with boycotts, with rockets, with bomb threats, but we are a stubborn and stiff-necked people that never, ever, gives up, and that will never cease seeing the world with a, with a lens of optimism and love, with hope and courage. Philanthropy is about being stubbornly health, hopeful. It's about believing that the world can and will be healed, that wrongs can be righted, that the future can and will be better than the past. 
And you can achieve anything if as a funder and as a person you risk more than others think is safe, love more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical, and expect more than others think is possible. That's why we're here together at JFN. We are here to discover that our dreams can be better and sweeter when we dream together. We are here to prove that we will go farther when we, go, when we walk together, each conserving his or her own individuality, but all focusing on the tough challenges that we face in these uncertain times. In the last years, we have grown enormously as a network, but we are still scratching the surface of what we, of we, we can achieve working together. What we can do is unimaginable if we choose to challenge our limits instead of limiting our challenges. I want to finish with a story that I love. Now, I don't know if the story is true, but if it's not, it deserves to be. And it's about how the Nobel Prize was created. You know that Alfred Nobel, during his, his lifetime, was known for being the creator of dynamite. He created dynamite, uh, or TNT, or whatever, you know, something that kills a lot of people. So, one day, his brother Ludwig died, and a newspaper thought that the one had, that had died was Alfred. And he published an obituary about him where he calls him a merchant of death. Now, Alfred Novell saw that and realized with horror that that was going to be the way in which history was going to remember him. And then he devoted the rest of his life to change that. And that's how the Nobel Prize got created. Now, Nobel had the benefit of a dry run of a funeral to sort of rehearse how the world was going to remember him. But we need to ask ourselves the, the same question. How do we want to be remembered? My teacher and my mentor was an American rabbi in Argentina called Marshall Mayer, who spoke Spanish with a funny accent and served during those years of the, of the military dictatorship. What I remember of him is that during those dark years of El Silencio y Salud, he encouraged us to speak, to debate, to listen to one another with respect, understanding, and love. He showed that Judaism is the exact opposite of that horrendous phrase. He made a community where everybody could feel at home. The choices he made in March 1976 resonate still today. They changed my life and then changed the life of an entire generation. When I think of him, I think of how he built a community that was the exact opposite of the dystopian view that the generals had. For the last few years, we've been living in historic times, and the most important question we need to ask ourselves is how we want to be remembered. What do we want history to say about our time, about our communities, and about our own contribution as philanthropists? The children of today are looking at us from the future and are asking us to weigh our choices very carefully. They matter. They matter for me in the 70s, and they will matter enormously for the kids that are growing up in this strange and unsettling 21st century. Our choices impact real lives of real people. They shape reality, and they'll determine how the, our community will look in decades to come. In these troubled times, we are the ones that can make bad things bearable and good things wonderful. Yes, the future is unpredictable, and yes, we may fail to see the end of the light of the tunnel. But the future is nothing but an infinite succession of present moments. So the best, the only thing we can do as Jews, as funders, is to live now as we think human beings should live. Doing that in defiance of all that is bad and scary around us is in itself a marvelous victory that we can all claim. Thank you.